All right, I think we can start. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, my name is Aina Björgo. I'm the director of uh, UNOSAT. And um, just before we get going, uh, we just have to do the boring part of a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded. Um, we will be using the Q&A tool to collect questions throughout the event. So don't hesitate to send them through this feature and not the chat. The chat will be used for general comments or in case of challenges, you can contact the host who will assist you. You are more than welcome to have your camera on and display your name and organization. However, we keep all mix off except for the panelists during their interventions. Uh, so from my side, I'm really pleased to have um, so many uh, good people with us here today. Uh, we'll hear from um, an opening welcome from Nikhil Seth, uh, the Assistant Secretary General and the Executive Director of, of UNITAR. Then we have guests, um, two guest speakers today, Alain Rettier, who started UNOSAT, uh, as well as Francesco Pisano, who has also been a manager of UNOSAT. Um, Alan is, current, is, current, is right now the co-founder and managing director of, and the chief technical officer of LDN Advisory, and Francesco is the director of the UN Library and Archives in Geneva. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, several, um, four uh, user testimonies to learn of the impact that UNICEF has on the ground. The first one is from the UN resident coordinator in Thailand, Ms. Gita Sawavana. Uh, we will also hear from Leo Martin, who is the information manager officer. Uh, at UNHCR, uh, as well as uh, Anne-Sophie Gerald, who is the Chief Technical Advisor and Project Manager of um, the uh, Vanuatu Electoral Project, DEEP, within the UN uh, Development Program, UNDP. Uh, we will also hear from Ms. Mr. Vinay Narian, who is the Head of Climate Change and International Cooperation Division within the Ministry of Economy in Fiji, and their um, experience uh, in towards national uh, disaster management. Um, so without further ado, I would like to, to call on um, the video to be um, the, uh, opening welcome from Nikhil Seth. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to be with you to celebrate UNOSAT's 20 years of operations. What a ride it has been. From the early days, with only a handful of people sitting at CERN, we now have a team of 50 people all over the world. As you may know, following the Secretary General's recommendations, UNOSAT was recognized as the UN Satellite Center by the United Nations Economic and Social Council, which happened earlier this year, which was a well-deserved recognition of the hard work done by this young team. UNOSAT is truly special within the United Nations system. Its focus on applications of satellite imagery and related geospatial technologies for both operational support to member states and UN sister agencies is truly unique. The use of satellite imagery as a cross-cutting technology in support of the Sustainable Development Agenda is being applied daily at UNOSAT. From support to disaster situations such as floods, earthquakes and tropical cyclones to support towards climate change adaptation, election planning, cost-efficient project monitoring, protection of cultural heritage sites and conflict analysis including human rights assessments, UNOSAT's use of technology is truly exceptional. However, to make sure member states can also benefit for these tools, a lot of effort goes into training and capacity development. UNOSAT has had over 12,000 beneficiaries from national governments, academic institutions, UN agencies, as well as other international organizations and non-governmental organizations. UNOSAT has also provided over 5,000 maps and satellite analysis, often the only source of information, especially during conflicts. UNOSAT has a significant focus on innovation. Its developments of practical tools for automatic flood monitoring using artificial intelligence 
has been a huge success and is now being implemented for many flood prone regions of the world. This allows for predictable information reaching the right decision makers at the right time. However, none of this would have been possible without the voluntary financial and in-kind contributions from so many member states. UNOSAT's financial support from Norway, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Sweden, Qatar and the European Union are some of these examples. The United States of America supports UNOSAT with in-kind access to commercial satellite imagery. I would also like to thank Switzerland as the host country for its very generous support. I am very proud to have UNOSAT part of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and look forward to further developments in support of member states and UN agencies as well as all our partners. Happy birthday UNOSAT. I now have the pleasure to read a message we have just received from the UN's Secretary General Antonio Guterres and I quote uh, Secretary General when he says, I am pleased to congratulate UNOSAT, the United Nations Satellite Center, on 20 years of outstanding support to the United Nations system and its member states. UNOSAT has steadily developed its portfolio of services over the years from humanitarian rapid mapping and environmental assessments to supporting the climate resilience of small island developing states, protecting cultural heritage, leveraging artificial intelligence, providing objective analysis during conflicts, and exposing human rights violations. As part of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNOSAT provides valuable training and capacity development to help communities prepare for floods and other natural disasters. We are grateful to UNOSAT's key partners, notably CERN and the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters, as well as the many member states that provide generous financial and other support. Outer space is a crucial global commons, but it remains undergoverned. To ensure the continued operating space for the critical work of centers like UNOSAT, my report on our common agenda proposes a multi-stakeholder outer space dialogue at the summit of the future in 2023. Satellite imagery and analysis is an essential resource for the United Nations and the broader multilateral community. I look forward to the vital contributions of UNOSAT as we work together to achieve a more resilient and safe future for all." Unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikhil, and thank you to the Secretary General for those kind words towards our program and congratulations to the whole team for being able to receive such great um, uh, feedback from the highest level. And um, with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Alain Rettier. Uh, Alain uh, goes way back. Uh, he was the one who uh, founded UNOSAT. And um, I'm very pleased to have you here, Alain. Uh, I often get the question, you know, how did UNOSAT start? What, what was the idea? Who came up with this great idea? And I always tell them it was you. Uh, so could you uh, enlighten us a bit, you know, what were your motivation, what were your thoughts, and how did you go about um, starting this, uh, this endeavor? Hi, uh, thank you, Anna, and um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think that the simplest way is to say who I am. I am uh, an agronomist, and I have dedicated my, my, my uh, professional life to help uh, poor people, uh, especially rural communities. And I started my career when I was uh, 23 years old 
uh, in southern Mexico with the Maya communities. And I did field work with them in a number of uh, um, uh, areas like food security. But um, I was, while trying to help them out, uh, I, I got really the feeling that uh, um, you can help with small thing, but if you want to make a change, you need to think bigger. And to think bigger, you need to, uh, to think territory. And territory means having access to the information. And what better than a satellite image can help you to connect the eagle view with the, the, the ground vision. And uh, uh, as nothing was really available at that time, I said, if I want this to happen, I need to make it. And it's how UNOSAT ID was born. So, so how did you then take it further? How did you were able to, to make this into a reality, Alan? Uh, well, you know, um, it was basically uh, 15 years of hard work as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. I'm not the only one for it. But as a leader, it took me about five years to prepare, two years to establish it. And mm -hmm. I had the pleasure to manage it uh, on, the, on the brain curve for eight years. So 15 years of work. Um, how I made it? Um, first of all, uh, um, I was blessed to be part of a, a great agency uh, called UNOPS. Uh, UNOPS is, uh, is a special uh, agency within the UN system because we have we had no particular mandate other than serving the other UN agencies. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, um, lucky enough to be uh, given the opportunity to represent uh, UNOPS in a very important think tank called the Brooking Process, where we were uh, all the donors and UN agencies trying to see how we could connect better emergency with development how to bridge this gap. And uh, uh, it became uh, very obvious for me that uh, uh, one of the key elements to bridge this gap was to uh, create a satellite uh, a support system that will help uh, uh, the operation during the emergency phase, but without losing the scope that all this information should be used mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, 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 and given back to the local actors for them to be able to incorporate and reduce the vulnerability of their territories to, to, to a number of issues like a, a major disaster, for example. And it's in this context that I met Francesco, actually, who was working uh, at what is now known as the ISDR. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when doing that, uh, what was your experience? Was it difficult to get support? Was it difficult for people to understand what you wanted to do? Because those were early days in terms of satellite imagery. Um, in fact, uh, um, uh, it, it was quite challenging in the normal UN uh, environment at that time, mm -hmm. uh, because of course uh, uh, there were so much needs in, uh, in direct uh, uh, support, either for emergency or for uh, for field work that uh, coming with a, um, a concept which was very technological was challenging. But I went to see the people that were actually generating this technology that were the, the Europe, in, in the case of UNOSAT, the European Space Agency and the French uh, um, uh, Space Center. And they were the, the, the first one to understand that there was something to be done there, that there was a real need. And they made, uh, 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 they, 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 they provided us with the first two millions that uh, um, were necessary to, to launch yeah. the, the, the whole project. So in the beginning, it was sort of thought of as a demonstration project or how was it? Well, actually, no, uh, it was more than a, a pilot project. He, he, they, they understood, and I, I, I really advocated very strongly for this, <laughs> uh, to make them understand <laughs> that UN was something important, something big, and something that was bringing concrete benefits to the right. people. And, uh, and, and this was not something that was uh, really easy for them to understand at the beginning, because they had the general uh, uh, public vision, which is just a, a place where uh, government talks uh, among themselves and, uh, and, and, and that few con uh, concrete actions are coming out of it. So I was basically an advocate for the cause of the UN in its field dimension. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I was sort of their teacher in how the system is organized, how the different UN agencies are working together and mm -hmm. what we were trying to do and to improve. Yeah, great. No, it's super interesting to, to understand how you, how you were thinking. Um, then, uh, then it was established uh, back, in, back in 2000, became really operational in 2001, which is what we are celebrating. Uh, can you tell us a bit, you know, what those early days were like? <laughs> um, uh, with due respect to all my uh, UN colleagues here present, um, it was very clear for me that uh, it was not with the kind of IT support we had at that time within the UN <laughs> that I could put together something so ambitious like, you know, that, that yeah. would need to, to actually push information to the most remote places on Earth. Mm -hmm. in the worst in the worst uh, situation uh, main uh, uh, most of the time in emergencies so but but in the neighborhood of geneva there is a very uh, um, uh, important institution which is actually a, a group of people who have constructed the biggest machine that humankind has ever built and of course, those people have been even inventing internet. And this was CERN. So I, I started to speak to them. I was introduced, thanks to my, uh, my, former, my colleague, uh, Christophe Nutan, who, who knew some people there. And I spent about six months convincing the deputy head of the uh, CERN IT department on what UNOSAT was about and what concretely in, uh, in technological term it would need. And, and he ended up by uh, understanding that uh, it was like, a, that in fact, satellite images were just no more than matrix. And like any matrix, uh, it could be uh, um, uh, uh, processed uh, through a, a, com a, a grid computing, which is now known as a cloud computing. Mm -hmm. But it was the idea of, of, of cutting the images in, in small pieces and distributing it in uh, 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 many machines. So, uh, so to have the, 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 the job done very yeah. quickly. I have and, a little uh, quiz for you, Alan, if I may interrupt you. And um, Camille, can you show us the little surprise for Alan? <laughs> <laughs> so Alan, do you uh, recognize this? Of course, of course <laughs> I remember that. Um, <laughs> Actually, after six months of hard talks with uh, uh, Jacques Altaber, the, the then uh, deputy director of uh, the CERN IT department, uh, I was able to, to obtain the privilege of having two small barracks, but two special small barracks because they were connected to the main uh, calculation center. Maybe uh, so you take the next slide. And the next one. Voilà. So those two barracks that you see in blue, voila, they are the places where we, we started to work. At that time, we were about uh, how many, six, seven, seven. Um, and, but those two barracks were connected with a very high speed link to the calculation center that you see on the, on the uh, right up uh, mm -hmm. uh, part of the, of the image. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, making us uh, 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 capable of pushing information as far as uh, Kashmir in the worst uh, uh, times where, where there was the major uh, uh, landslides there uh, uh, following the, the earthquake in, uh, in 2006. Yeah. Now I'm just looking also at the chat here and uh, uh, you know, this story is great. It's the equivalent of starting your business in the garage basement. And it's really what it was, wasn't it? It was really a startup. Yeah, it was a startup. And uh, I, I think we have talked about technology. We have talked about, uh, about a partnership, uh, strategic partnership. But I want to talk about people. Hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, uh, this has been uh, a teamwork since Absolutely. the very beginning. And I would like to mention, uh, to mention at least two of the key godfathers of UNOSAT. One was my direct boss at UNOPS, uh, Mr. Christophe Bouvier, who is now retired. And the second one was Marcel Boisa, who was the, 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 the executive director of UNITA at that time. Mm -hmm. And those two people actually, uh, 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 I was blessed to have their confidence 
and they, 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 they gave me the, the, the green light to start moving uh, UNOSAT forward. Great. Then, of course, uh, a great team joined me. Uh, and um, the first one was uh, Olivier, who was, uh, who was a former uh, um, uh, commercial Senegal, right? officer, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Uh, commercial officer at Spot Image, who connected me with CNES, actually, and with uh, the European Space Agency, and became a, a, a pillar of uh, one of the first pillars. I, I always said that I had a, a, a right hand and a, and a left hand, and you are now coming from UNHCR, you were the the, the, the second on board. And then uh, shortly after came Francesco. So <laughs> here you had the, the, the bon des quatre, as we say in French. And, uh, and, and it's really great to, uh, to see that we are, uh, uh, you, uh, INR, uh, or, or, uh, you, you have the experience since the very beginning. So uh, uh, you're really the, the, the best person to, 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 uh, to manage the, the UNOSAT as it is now. And to push uh, and really congratulations for what you achieved uh, by uh, um, getting this uh, this uh, this mandate formalized. No, thank you for that. Um, no, I also remember very well my, my first uh, days uh, at Unisat and I had the pressure to to be working in those barracks and and yeah, it's true. It does something to you. You know, you you don't take anything for granted. You know, yes, we were working for the UN, but uh, always extrovertory. So. So doing it that way, I think it, it's put you in, in a nice position to, to really do your best. And it was a great team back then. Olivier Senegas was, was absolutely instrumental. Uh, and um, I think, you know, we had many, many big successes. But if you, allow, if you were to highlight one big success, what would it be? What would be the main thing you would be most proud of, of starting? Aha! Uh -huh. I know exactly. Actually, uh, to be honest, at that time, I don't know if this has changed because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit uh, away from the UN. Uh, I'm continuing working with the UN, but in a different way now. But uh, at that time, there were a lot of competition between agencies, especially in the humanitarian uh, mm -hmm. uh, group. Huh? And, um, and of course, uh, many would have liked to have the idea of UNOSAT, but uh, mm -hmm. actually we are the only one to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there was a before where we had really to, 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 to make our room, actually. Mm -hmm. And there was an after. And this event that was for me the, the corner point was um, the, the big tsunami. Mm -hmm. Because this has happened uh, at the time of Christmas. And everybody was on holiday except us. Mm -hmm. So I got a call from Geneva from the OCHA uh, uh, on-duty officer. And he said, Alain, can you do something about, uh, do you know what is happening in, uh, in, in Sumatra? Do you know what, what has happened? What, uh, can you do something about it? So the first thing I did was to call the, the, the International Chart Charter Space and Major Disaster. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, a UN officer was given the authority to uh, uh, command 13 satellites to picture uh, Sumatra, Banda Hachi. Mm. And we were the ones that uh, had the control. I had the control for about two weeks of 13 satellites. It was the first time ever that a UN officer uh, was uh, granted this responsibility. Mm. And, and we produced a lot of maps. We served thousands of organizations. And one day, there was a, a big meeting. You remember, Francesco, because you were there. Uh, at that time, Kofi Annan was our uh, UN Secretary General. And Kofi Annan was sharing a big meeting. There were all the UN agencies and donors represented there in a big room in, in Geneva. And at, a, at, at the moment, he, he was called by his, um, uh, his chief of staff because he had to attend a, a, an urgent call. And he went out of the room and then turned back to his, uh, his, 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 the place where, from where he was sharing and took a set of maps. And those were the UNOSAT maps. And everybody saw that. <laughs> and after that, our work was far easier. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for all those uh, um, nice uh, stories, Alain. It's really inspiring to hear. Um, now I'd like to pass to, and uh, thank you so much. I hope you, you will stay with us, please. 
And, sure, I would. Um, uh, I would pass the floor over to Francesco. Uh, Francesco, you uh, basically took over after Alain. Yes, yes, I did well. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm humbled. I, I think this is so great. It's great to, to be here in this moment in, in time and history. You know, when, when I was with UNOSAD, and then when I became in charge of UNOSAD, it was, a, it, it was a hard time. We were working hard. We had less money than we needed. And one of the things that we used to say very often is that if the UN is serious about impact, then one day, this program will be a satellite center of the UN. And we work really, I think we had this faith, this conviction that one day uh, this, this would happen and, and that day has arrived. So um, congrats to all of you, congrats to all of us because we built on one another. You see what I, what I, think, what I think has happened is, 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 is a world-class example of transformative leadership. So that is the story that I, I want to tell you to all of you who are listening. It's a story really of, of, of true sustained and transformative leadership. Uh, it started with Alan. It started with, 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 with people like Alan who have crazy ideas, but you see, they don't know that it's crazy. And that's what makes it possible. And uh, I recognize that what he did was really the first base on which this could grow. And, and that genetic material that he rightly said, startup, is still there, still with you. That's why you're so successful because you have this streak of genes uh, of startup mentality. And that comes from what Alan put together. Well, the team I worked with was bigger. Uh, we fixed the money rap quite rapidly and then we started growing and growing the portfolio services. So the first thing that I remember that I want to share back with you after, after all these years is this sense of leadership as courage. We were courageous, and I think you still are, guys, ladies and, 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 and gentlemen. So we were the smallest, the youngest. Um, we were the least protected um, you know, gig in town in the UN. And uh, we got into conflict situations that no one dared to mingle with. We got into devastating disasters. Alan talk, talked about the tsunami. And it's true, everyone was on holiday. And we were there, ready to work. And um, we got delicate jobs as witnesses with the International Criminal Court. Um, the, the emerging or rapid mapping as a service and not as a publicity stunt for the satellite industry. Uh, there are two rapid mappings out there. And we were really there for the service. I, I think that um, we led the way with courage. And this, this is something that I want to, to, to share back. And, uh, you know, Alan told the story of, of, of Kofi Annan. I got actually a call once uh, by the, secretari the secretariat of, uh, of Ban Ki-moon. And so this lady calls me and she says, I remember it was 7.30 in the morning. I, I was just parking my bicycle. And I got this, this, uh, this call on my mobile. And there is the front office, this is the front office of the Secretary General. And I said, yes, okay. And they said, the Secretary General would like to know when is the next time you're in New York, because he would like to see you. And so to cut it short, I went to New York uh, and, um, and he sat me down in, in his office for half an hour, just he and I. And so this was not a turning point for the program, but it was a turning point for me as a person, because he told me what you do is pure courage. I want you to never stop doing this. And then I told him, then you need to help us because we see, we, we live in an organization that delivers by mandate, not by need. So I need the mandate. And he told me that you will have to do it yourself. I'm just asking you as your secretary general, I remember that as your secretary general, not to stop doing this. And so you remember, uh, certainly I, know, I came back and I told you this story and I said, we're never gonna stop. And so this is the second characteristic of our leadership. It was leadership to change things. And the way the UN plans and reacts to emergency, how technology is there to be used and make a difference. I think this is a characteristic of UNOSAT. And um, change doesn't come out of the rule book. And this is something that big organizations like the UN do not understand. They're designed not to understand this. And this is a pity. And so change 
does not come from the rule book. It comes from creativity and stubbornness, despite the, the rule book. Now, stubbornness, and someone said before me, is a virtue only when you're right. Uh, when you're wrong is, uh, is very bad, but we were right. We were right in believing the rapid mapping and the, the contribution of the satellite analysis because we were keen, we were into analysis at that time. And so, and so we continue and we continue and we never, we were never subversive. I don't think the units had subverted any rules, but it always operated to serve the values uh, and the commitments of the UN right where it was needed in the field, in regional offices, in the UNOCC situation room later on in New York on the 17th floor. So you may ask, so, okay, you didn't subvert it, so where is the change? Well, the change is that today UN Satellite Application Center, uh, the UN Satellite Center exists today. And that is a huge change for an organization like the UN. So I think it took, it took time, but, uh, but this is, this is really what it makes it worth the while. And then just to add a, a final thought is the kind of leadership um, for innovation. Now, innovation in large organizations is just a buzzword. Bureaucracies use innovation uh, to distract attention when they move furniture, old furniture, a bit around from time to time, mostly for budgeting reasons. Uh, but, uh, but this team took innovation really, really seriously. And the whole history of UNOSAT is a history of innovation on first times. I could, I could mention here at least a dozen of things that UNOSAT did for the first time ever, ever. And though some of those things are still living today as golden standard in the, in the, uh, in the industry. So you see, I think in the end that it's true what, what a, great, a great leader said. Uh, he said, excellence always win. And it's true, and it's true. And I think that, um, that UNOSAT is excellent and that's why you won, that's why we won. Sometimes it's, it takes 20 years. And as Alan said, it's amazing. It, it took 20 years, but here we are. And so this is a time of celebration, not regretting the time it took. Thank you so much, Francesco. That was really great and really inspirational. Thank you so much for those words. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I think we should also uh, hear um, some stories, uh, testimonies uh, of uh, the beneficiaries of, of these services that you have been uh, you have been hearing about. So uh, Camille, if you can play the, the first video, please. Assistant Secretary General Nicole Said, esteemed colleagues and distinguished guests. It's my pleasure to join you virtually for celebrating UNOSAT's 20th anniversary and also extend our thanks for the services UNOSAT has provided to UN funds, programs, specialized agencies, and the member states in support of the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, Thailand experienced widespread flooding in the central and northeastern provinces this year, a decade after the devastating 2010 floods. Triggered by two tropical storms and persistent monsoon rains, floods occurred in a vast geographical area. The hazard was also very dynamic given that floodwaters moved from the highlands to plains over two months. The insights from satellite image analysis provided daily by UNOSAT helped the government and the UN to understand the extent of flooding, potential hotspots across provinces, the number of people impacted and the nature of immediate support required at the community level. The periodic satellite updates also helped us monitor the trend of flood evolution and compare the situation against the 2010 flooding to offer evidence-based flooding scenarios. To tackle the vast geographical scope and the long duration of the event, UNOSAT used artificial intelligence and developed a decision-making dashboard that we embedded in the UN Thailand website to institutionalize dissemination. The high quality, evidence-driven rapid analysis proved invaluable during the emergency when objective information is typically hard to come by. We understand that the government is also using the satellite image of UNOSAT to map agricultural damage and compensate affected farmers across the country. 
based on this engagement, FAO and UNDP will be partnering, partnering with UNOSAT to support subnational capacity building to utilize satellite imagery to better respond to emergencies at the local level and track the impact on agricultural yields. As you're aware, satellite imagery has become one of the crucial tools for disaster risk management and resilience building. It gives us the ability to collect continuous observations of the Earth, which shapes our understanding of hazard dynamics, development pat patterns, monitoring of risk driving factors like climate change, environmental degradation. Satellite imagery can also provide crucial information to analyze air pollution patterns, provide data for biodiversity assessment, and help farmers to engage in more sustainable agricultural practices. In addition to that, frontier technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics can unlock hidden patterns, making satellite data more practical for member states, private sector, and the civil society. We are confident UNOSAT will continue to deliver the operational services and to develop cap capacities across the UN and the government to advance SDGs by harnessing the power of these modern tools and technologies. I would like to end by congratulating UNOSAT on its new status as the United Nations Satellite Center approved by the ECOSOFT resolution earlier this year. The UN country team in Thailand looks to continuing to work with you to bring the benefits of satellite imagery and other geospatial technology applications to the people in need. I would also encourage other UN country teams to make best use of these very useful services from UNOSAT. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. That was uh, the uh, UN resident coordinator in Thailand, Ms. Gita Sabavanal. Uh, I now have the pleasure to um, hand the floor over to Leo Martin, who is the information manager officer in the GIS support unit with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. UNOSAT has been supporting um, the High Commissioner's office for, for many years, and um, we have been uh, steadily growing uh, the support uh, and uh, uh, have many, many uh, examples of how this type of work has been used in many different situations. Now, Leo uh, will be uh, showing us uh, a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, please don't hesitate uh, um, if you have any questions to, to Leo. Over to you, Leo. Thank you, Einar, and thank you for the invitation to this event. So can you all see the screen well? Yes. Okay. So as you mentioned, we've been working really closely with uh, UNOSAT for years now. And the presentation I'm going to provide is only on two really recent use cases, like concrete use case on how UNOSAT can support the field operations. Um, but you could extend those use cases to dozens of other situations, mostly related to refugee site mapping, which is the, the area where most of the time we ask for the support. The first use case that I'm going to uh, present is about Tungogara, which is a refugee site in Zimbabwe. We had in the last two weeks a support request to build a mapping and monitoring system for wash facilities inside the camp, especially on a new part of the camp, a new extension that has been created this year. Most of the time, when we are asked to support on site mapping, we will search first for a satellite imagery and see what is the free available one. In that case, we had this image from Esri World Imagery that was from September 2020, so one year ago. The new extension doesn't appear on the map uh, yet because it would be somewhere in the middle in this area that you see a lot of vegetation. You see the camp on the top left corner. Also, the resolution of this image is quite poor at high um, zoom levels. So it's not enough to work um, on site as a site planner or as a watch officer to start building your you know, water network, for instance. And as we don't have access to the raw data of the image, we cannot use uh, play with the bands and change the symbology to try to play with the contrast or things like this. 
So for this specific case, we requested a support from UNOSAT and you were able to provide us with this really sharp satellite image from 13th of September, 2021. So it was basically a two weeks old image from the time we requested it, I think, because it was mid October or something like this. Uh, the resolution is really uh, good because it's probably what is the best available in commercially uh, right now, which is World View 3, 30 centimeter resolution. And you can see on it the new extension and the, um, the beginning of the, the road network that is created to, to shape the, the new part of the camp. Also, you provided us uh, with the extract of the building. Uh, so you can, this is a support that you also do for us, automatic extraction of the buildings, which is really important for us uh, because it will be used for the new addressing system and also uh, density analysis. Most of the time, these new extensions are created to um, uh, de-densify the existing part of the camp. So having this building extraction is, is a really uh, interesting data also. And then you can see, for instance, what we are currently working on with the WASH officer and the Regional Bureau of Southern Africa. It's a tool to monitor the WASH facilities on site and also to start to plan the new water network in the, in the extension with uh, water pipes and uh, tap streams. Uh, so the, the image will be used in all the derived products from uh, online web maps that you can see here, but also we tied it so they can have it accessible on the smartphone for the different data collection tools that they use on site. And also site planners work a lot with the AutoCAD and uh, it's also possible to open the images on AutoCAD. So it, it really is used in all the different uh, tools and at all the different stage of then the mapping and the monitoring, the planification as like a reference background that is uh, way better than what would be available um, for free with like Esri or Google Satellite, for instance. The second use case that I have is um, about Maratani refugee site in Mozambique. That time it was to support a sampling for a nutrition survey. So um, they wanted to, to come up with a, a scientific way to do random sampling of the shelters uh, inside the site, but also in the host community around the site to then um, go to, to directly to the shelters and uh, um, do a survey on nutrition to come up with the, the nutrition statistics in the site. For this, we used, and it for, uh, for the first time in UNHCR, your tool, um, Pulse Satellite, that is developed by uh, UN Global Pulse and, and UNOSAT, which is a tool that uses uh, AI and uh, neural network to do the uh, building extraction automatically. So we were guided uh, by your team on this tool, and we were really impressed by the result really easily. It's possible to extract all the buildings from a satellite image with a few iteration and adaptation of the model, but you see it uh, here, it's a screenshot of the tool. Um, you have to select a few square as your reference layer, work a bit on it, and then the tool does the rest. It's, it was really, really impressive. And it's, um, it's something that made us gain a lot of time because really when we started to discuss about it, on site somebody said, uh, now we will have to point every shelter one by one and it might take some time. And I said, no, uh, I know that you know that as this new tool, we are going to be able to do this shelter extraction for you. And they were really uh, impressed because they were uh, starting to digitalize one by one all the buildings um, at the uh, field level from the satellite image. And then, so you can see the result here, each point is, is, a, is a building. And then we just did like um, a random sampling on it, a random selection a bit inside subclusters and um, it's not completely random, but um, you will get the ID. And then we can export those points, put them in a smartphone application as a GPS point for navigation. And the assessment team will go shelter by shelter and provide um, the, the nutrition assessment. So we are once again, really impressed by this tool. I, it can also do flood analysis and rooftop analysis that we haven't tried yet, but we, 
are looking forward to have uh, some use cases to, to try those. So once again, thank you for the invitation and for all the support that you've been providing to UNHCR. It was only two short, uh, concrete examples to show you like how it can support operation. But like I said, we can have dozens of other, also all the maps that are produced by uh, REACH for CCCM, uh, for which is a cluster sometimes led by UNHCR, are really helpful for us. So thanks again for, for your support during all these years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo, uh, for these excellent examples. I think is, you know, many of these things you, we, we think, tend to think about mapping refugee camps as just, you know, providing the shelters. Uh, but your uh, testimony here shows that, you know, it's actually being used for something. It's not just to have, have a, a nice map, but it's actually to, to take informed decisions. And I think that's really interesting. Um, so from also a bit, um, you know, the way that when we first started to, to look at um, uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, it really also came out of, um, of the Syria situation, because there we were quite active in, in analyzing, um, especially the al satari camp. And what was um, happening there was that a lot of people were crossing the border from, uh, from Syria into to Jordan. Uh, and basically, uh, that camp became uh, Jordan's fourth largest city in a very short amount of time. Uh, and it was also, you know, not that easy to analyze it because people were moving around in the camp. So it wasn't just a question of adding new tents. Basically, every time you had to reanalyze the whole camp. And um, uh, our analysts uh, for them uh, were going crazy because they had to do this over and over and over again very dedicated to it and the results were great, but you know, it's a bit of a waste of time in terms of, of, uh, of uh, experienced analysts. So that is how we, we also started to, to work with, with the UNHCR, with Andrew Harper and, uh, and, uh, and uh, another colleagues, of course, uh, in, in this, um, this, uh, for these tools to, to be developed. So, so really, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, you know, showing us how this actually makes a difference on the ground. Thank you. Are there any questions? If not, uh, feel, do feel free to put questions in, in the chat window and we can, uh, we can take them also uh, later on. Uh, sorry, in the Q&A window. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Leo. Then we will move to um, another video. Uh, this one is by Anne-Sophie Gerard. She's the Chief Technical Advisor and Project Manager of the Vanuatu Electoral Environment Project, LEAP, uh, uh, with the UN Development Program. Um, this video is, is um, uh, very interesting, I think. Uh, it uh, really goes into a lot of details, and uh, I'm looking forward to see how um, you know, satellite imagery is also being used for these type of applications. Thank you. Good afternoon from Vanuatu. We are constantly being advised to be resilient, to pivot and to respond to emerging challenges. The innovative collaboration between UNUSAT and UNDP's Vanuatu Electoral Environment Project is an example of a situation where a disaster response has led to great innovation and change. In 2020, Vanuatu ranked in the top 10 nations in the world for vulnerability to natural disasters and truly lived up to its ranking with the devastating and, and dual impact of both Category 5 Tropical Cyclone Herald combined with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This year, Vanuatu has again been ranked top one uh, on the World Risk Report. So, Interagency planning and response has long hindered Vanuatu by the paucity of accurate democratic data and poor location mapping. And Vanuatu is a Y-shaped archipelago consisting of about 83 relatively small geologically new islands of volcanic origin. Uh, about 80% of them are inhabited and stretches over approximately 1,500 kilometers between the most northern and southern islands. So Vanuatu is the most uh, linguistically diverse nation per capita as well in the world, with around 140 distinct languages. 
So therefore, the few and outdated maps we had were further complicated by the, these multiple dialects in one, one village, resulting in many names for one community and with the on-flow negative implications for planning delivery. In the past, there were many incidences of multiple disaster responses where packages being delivered to one village that had four names, meaning, of course, they got more response packages, but rather confusing planning, unstructured, uncoordinated planning. So the innovative response to these complicated issues has now been provided by a simple strategy. The biometric national ID card linked with the UNOSAT web maps with location data, GPS location data. In time, verifiable, accurate and cross-sectoral in its potential application and usage. So disaster response organizations such as IOM and Vanuatu's Disaster, Net disaster Management Office has been watching with interest the rollout of the, the national biometric ID cards throughout Vanuatu and in close collaboration with the civil registry the project has developed an app which was developed or loaded onto more than 400 solar charge tablets and then we supported putting registration and data validation teams on all the inhabited islands guided by the UNOSAT maps developed in, col in collaboration between UNOSAT UNITA and, and UNDP and these were basically developed on the data and the satellite imagery that was developed for the 2020 and 2021 joint civil and voter registration data validation verification field work in Vanuatu. The maps were developed using very high resolution satellite images and they were then used to analyze and provide baseline data for um, enumerators on the ground to identify villages, locations and, and displaced communities. So the data collected for the national ID card was expanded with UNOSAT's technical support to include GPS location data um, on the persons that resided on the islands and in the villages where they had moved to um, as there is a lot of villages seem to move in Vanuatu. Um, and we then included the, the GPS uh, location data on the village together with their facial images and gender, date of birth and as much of an address as is possible in Vanuatu. So ostensibly this informed the national ID card for a verifiable in-time electoral role which had in the past been a very uh, inflated role. Uh, but now linked to these atlas maps and a specific identifying number or code for each village and polling station locations, agencies in Vanuatu have seen the huge potential and beneficial ramifications, um, not merely for the transparent, accurate electoral roles, but also for the rollout of disaster responses, for cash-based payments, for displaced persons, for management and resourcing of evacuation centers, <clears throat> and so forth. The Ministry of Health has already utilized the combined national ID card and the web, web map identifiers for uh, the implementation of the national vaccination campaign. And the Ministry of Education has commenced utilization of the data uh, and mapping to plan school locations, school, school constructions, teacher staffing numbers, uh, procurement of material uh, for the new season, uh, the school year, and so on. So, at the same time, the Ministry of Health has noted that the vaccination rollout and the healthcare system in general has been benefiting from the support by our mutual project and that the, this support has resulted in high level of data accuracy and um, a very professional operation. And moreover, the increased national ID coverage will also allow the Ministry of Health to implement an improved patient information system in the coming years. But again, the increase of the reach of the national ID has been facilitated by solid maps that have identified where the, the citizens of Vanuatu live. 
So just now, last month, end of October, we invited numerous uh, national stakeholders and international stakeholders to a presentation um, of UNITA and uh, UNDP in collaboration, presenting maps uh, based on these satellite images from the field work uh, and uh, presenting these geographic and demographic data that were established um, based on, um, on the maps produced by UNITA and help to create these multiple page atlases for each island, like static web maps to, to, web maps to aid field workers to, to identify where voters and citizens lived. Especially useful in rural communities that were located far from the main town and centers. And, and honestly, prior to this mapping exercise, there was very limited digital database of, of voters and in general residents in Vanuatu. So with this new, these new maps and these new data sets, it is our great hope that these data sets will become a vital contributor to many departments in the future. And we really wish to see these maps and the data to be widely used in Vanuatu by, by multiple stakeholders. And, and, um, and furthermore, that they make use of the trained enumerators that now have IT literacy in each of the dialects of, of, of the islands of Vanuatu. That all this is seized in the future, uh, which is they are now for the vaccination efforts. The training of all these close to 100 enumerators and the cross-sectoral and multi-agency buy-in strengthens the sustainability uh, uh, and the outcomes of not merely in Vanuatu but regionally. So, carpe diem, as the old Latin goes, um, seizing the opportunity or seizing, seizing the day as it emerges, this strategy, this our combined strategy, has seen innovation and change emerge from disaster and turned reactiveness in Vanuatu to proactiveness, truly changing a risk into opportunity and a positive outcome. These maps can now be used by multiple array of stakeholders for pandemics, for natural disaster responses and for any government planning as, uh, as part of their strategic tools. Donors, private sectors, NGOs, government agencies, I believe have all quickly realized and recognized the integrated national IDs and the mapping systems potential. This innovation is being watched with keen interest from Oceania, so not just in Vanuatu, and it's a readily replicable strategy. So thank you very much. We have tremendously enjoyed our partnership and the great collaboration with the UNITA team and happy anniversary and warm greetings from Vanuatu. Thank you so much. I think this is, you know, one of the great examples uh, of uh, cross-cutting use of satellite technologies. We often say, you know, we, we talk about this technology as being cross-cutting, and here we have a really a practical example zone. And, but I would like also to, to hear a bit from, you know, the, the analysts that are actually doing this job. So Solange, uh, are, you, are you there? See if she can join us. Hello. Yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you, Solange. So, Solange, can you um, explain a bit? You know, because you were very much involved in this. Um, can you explain a bit what you did uh, in terms of uh, of the satellite analysis? What kind of data were you using? How long did it take you? What were the challenges, for example? Uh, yes. Um... So this uh, was really like um, a job or a project where we had to, to create data from scratch, uh, except the imageries uh, and a few, a few point data we had from, from, uh, from Vanuatu. There was no, um, no more, we had to create everything from scratch, the methodologies and, and adapt everything to the local um, situation or, 
being um, uh, viewed from the satellite imagery, which shows also the, the power of it. You can actually like, uh, from, from what you saw in the video, there is a uh, different structures, different um, um, look of every building. So it was really going through uh, the imageries and finding data and, and mapping all the buildings. So the challenge was just uh, sitting from um, Geneva and taking all those things and, and account that in, in a country that we've never been, and that was uh, <laughs> uh, that was uh, one of uh, the uh, the problems uh, and, and issues we 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 had. And um, as you saw, also it's an island country. So, uh, or as Anne Sophie uh, described, like fifteen hundred kilometer from south to north, and more than eighty. <laughs> Uh, single islands, so it was not a, an easy <laughs> um, work uh, to do, uh, considering that um, geography. Um, but also uh, our partners at UNDP were really, really helpful, uh, which is very important. And we also have um, our in-country staff who helped us to also like fill up the gaps of information we had in order to to produce all maps so it's not only the buildings and the, uh, and and the atlas we made uh we also did some analysis of the data we produced to in order you know, to give uh UNDP some insights uh, and the Panot Electoral uh, Commission to give them insights on, on where people live and um, what's the distance they have to to make to, from from where they live to 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 go casting their votes and all those information uh, are helpful to for example plan ahead next elections and Vanuatu is also a country that has elections like for many elections maybe you can compare them to Switzerland um, so that's really our, our data were, were were very useful in that sense. Well, thank that's, you so much. That's a brief. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I'm really impressed by by the work that you and the team has been doing. Uh, and again, you know, it shows uh, how important this work is. You're really making a difference uh, uh, as as an analyst at UNOSAT. You are making a huge difference in the world. So, uh, so I really do want to thank you and and the rest of the team, of course. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then we move on to uh, Mr. Vinay Narayan who is the head of the Climate Change and International Cooperation Division within the Ministry for Economy of Fiji. And he will be speaking to us uh, about his experiences regarding a national disaster management. I'm Vinil Narai, heading Fiji's Climate Change and International Cooperation Division with the Ministry of Economy. And I'll be speaking to you briefly on the impact of UNICEF rapid mapping response that was provided during the recent cyclones. The National Disaster Management Office or MDMO, as we call it, plays various roles enacted for the implementation of disaster-related policies, plans, and activities laid out by the Disaster Management Council and the Vision Cabinet. The, this rather includes the activation of the National Emergency Operations Center, or the NEOC, during disasters to coordinate activities of disaster monitoring, warning, and immediate post-disaster response. The NEOC is activated when a specific threat of disaster develops or when disaster strikes and it's made on a 24-hour basis by teams drawn from the public service and governmental agencies carrying out its functions according to the NDMO standard operating procedures. The response teams obtain regular situation reports from the divisional and district emergency operation centers as well as facilitate requests for assistance from the public during emergencies. The government declared a state of natural disaster for both Tropical Cyclone Harold and Tropical Cyclone Yasa to enable the smooth implementation of response efforts, including activation of evacuation centers, which are mostly schools, and emergency operation centers in all four divisions of Fiji. Coordination during emergencies is carried out through the Fiji cluster system, which creates partnerships between international humanitarian actors, national and local authorities, as well as civil society. I was engaged with NDMO during the recent disasters as the Ministry of Economy is the lead for the logistics cluster. 
I understand that UNETA through the UNICET provided rapid mapping services by activating the International Space Charter for both Tropical Cyclone Hell and Tropical Cyclone Yasa in 2020 to support the NEOC operations and rather covered some impacted areas and this is highly appreciated. This information was helpful for the NDMO team in terms of correlating with the official damage assessment data coming in from the divisional EOC field teams. Initial damage assessments are then reviewed into detailed damage assessments once we have more field information. The UNICEF web map, where you can download these rapid mapping products, are also resourceful to the development partners that are part of the Fiji cluster network that may quickly need that information to activate their response to these affected areas. On behalf of the Fijian government, I would like to ex extend our appreciation to UNITA for their timely and effective assistance during national emergencies. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so in terms of, um, um, if anyone has any questions uh, that you would like to, to raise, if not, If not, Camille, uh, uh, can you please show the, the timeline slide? Um, I just wanted to, to go back a little bit here because you have been hearing about the various things that have been happening throughout uh, the life cycle so far of, of UNOSAT. Um, really going, taking back to, to the year 2000, 2001, uh, where we were born, hosted at CERN, as, as Alain explained. Um, we also had the great pleasure of being partnering with the International Charge from Space and Major Disaster as part of the UN back in 2003. Uh, in 2006, uh, to our surprise, we got uh, the UN 21 award, which was a uh, very, uh, very nice uh, uh, recognition of the work. Um, we also, uh, back in 2008, started to develop um, more uh, on, in terms of um, capacity development. Before that, we didn't do that much capacity development, but we saw that this was a, definitely a need. And if we were to succeed, it's important to, to uh, have uh, local uh, governments and, and communities also being trained in, in the use of, of uh, satellite imagery. Um, we also, a uh, little bit later, started uh, the human rights mapping. Um, this has been hugely successful. We have not shown that much of it here today, but uh, this is something uh, we have a whole team working on, uh, uh, and we are really, really appreciative of, uh, of uh, their work because this also makes a, a difference when it comes to, of course, human rights investigations. Um, we have also seen how uh, the, um, the information that we, we, we gather during conflict situations uh, are used later by, by, the, by human rights actors, all the way up to the International Criminal Court. Um, then, uh, back in 2011, uh, we uh, initiated the, the Orchestra Chad project. This was a huge project financed, financed by the Swiss authorities. And we are also, um, we had that going on for several years and it really uh, helped um, the government of Chad to, to mark out where, where there were potential uh, sources for, for, for water um, uh, Drilling. Uh, at the same time, we also initiated the REACH project. REACH is a, is a um, collaboration with the uh, ACTED and, uh, and the IMPACT initiatives. And here, uh, what initiated this was the, the, um, the catastrophe in, in Kyrgyzstan, where um, there was a huge community uh, that got burned down, and, um, and REACH uh, sent people uh, to, or IMPACT sent, or ACTED sent people to the ground. And, uh, and uh, they really um, benefited from the type of satellite imagery that we could provide. So based on that, um, uh, it's been a huge success, I would say, to, to continue in, in with REACH. This is the partnership that is going on uh, daily. We, we, we are, every day we, have, uh, working with, we are working with REACH. Um, then we also, uh, a little bit later, also thanks to collaboration with CERN, we were looking at different crowdsourcing mechanisms. We developed the UN Assign application thanks to a partnership with Enso Technologies. A um, little bit later, we also opened offices in Nairobi and Bangkok. And I think this was a huge milestone because once we were able to do that, uh, we were much closer to, to, to the field. Of course, we were, we were a small team, 
uh, but still having you know people uh, sitting in Nairobi and Bangkok provide hugely valuable for us. Um, further on, uh, back in 2015, uh, we teamed up with UNESCO uh, to, to look at uh, um, assessments over heritage sites in Yemen, Syria, Nepal, uh, etc. And this is a partnership that is still going on, and uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, uh, the protection of cultural heritage sites. Um, back in uh, 2017, we started to develop food forecasting systems. Um, uh, the first one was for Guyana, um, and then uh, comes also in, back in 2018, uh, a very uh, important project, uh, the Common Sensing Project. We have not presented it that much today, uh, but um, the, the, the Common Sensing Project is financed by the UK Space Agency. It's, uh, it's a four-year uh, project um, that we have been uh, delivering um, that is almost uh, towards its end. And here we have developed various types of decision-making tools for the governments of Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. Um, a common Sensing is, is um, really, uh, uh, I would say, a flagship project of ours. And it links both um, climate information, it links uh, disaster risk reduction, it links food security, and very interestingly, it also links up to climate finance. So this is where also we're working with the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, in, the, in, the, in the, out of London, and of course also their climate finance advisors. And moving up to 2020, uh, we saw the development of UNOSAT flood AI uh, model. Here, I also would like to, to really thank the University of Wuhan in China uh, of uh, the great collaboration we have had with them uh, on all the, the excellent interns they have been providing us with. And then, of course, leading up to, um, to the UN Satellite Center back in 2021, uh, uh, we were very pleased to have this recognition uh, that also went with, with a clear mandate to what we were doing. And um, yes, that was really uh, something for us to, to, to be very proud of. And uh, I would like to, to thank all the team and, of course, everyone. Uh, there are many people who had a common gone of UNICEF over, the, over these 20 years. Uh, I'm not going to mention anyone in particular, but so many people have also found very interesting jobs elsewhere. And, um, and I think uh, the, um, the feedback we got is that the experience from UNICEF has been hugely uh, valuable for them in, in getting also uh, advancing their careers. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to, um, unless there are any questions. Um, you know, if, yes. if you allow me, yes, well, Alain has his hand raised. Um, he ah, did yes, provide Alain. a comment uh, yes. that didn't make it to everyone. I will keep it for later when, you, when you're finished. Uh, and there is something I, I would like to say, but uh, Please uh, continue, and okay. I will uh, I will uh, take uh, take the floor when I'm allowed. Mm -hmm. You keep us in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we we did get a couple of questions from uh, the Q and A. Um, how did UNOSAT become a UNITAR program? Uh, asking specifically to Francesco, this leadership as courage is a very inspiring idea. How can we as UNOSAT staff cultivate this value in our daily work? Um, who, who, who needs to answer what? Uh, I can answer both, but I don't know if Alain wants to tell the story. Uh, I think I'm the person who drove, who drove uh, uh, the, the vehicle UNOSAT into, into UNITAR. Well, it happened because uh, UNOPS was managing a project for us, and that project turned into a program. And, um, and UNOSAT was the, 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 a bigger house in terms of programmatic approach. And, and when, when, when UNICEF entered, UNICEF was living already in the house of UNITAR, but it was a project uh, motorized uh, by, powered by, by, by UNOPS. And there was no conflict there. There, 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 there was a transition. I think it was a question of size and it was a question of projecting ourselves as the center to be. And today completes that. And I think that we were right, all of us, uh, in driving that transition. And I think we were right also with the UNOPS colleagues who uh, accepted that transition without obstruction. And I, actually, when I talk about obstruction, I want to pay tribute to all the resistors 
those people that were less intelligent than us in Athens and resisted. There is a change, they resisted innovation. Uh, they play mandate against uh, substance. <laughs> those people helped us draw the definite map where we needed to go. They made us more courageous. They made us stronger. So I think it's a time to pay tribute to them and also pay positive tribute to a couple of names that all of you know, ESA, the European Space Agency, ESRI. These are the peoples that are outside the boundaries of the UN, including the State Department in the US, believed not in the brand and the mandate, but believed in what was needed to be done at that time, and they helped us out. Uh, for the question of, of, of uh, courage, uh, leadership as courage, you have it in all of you because you, I, I follow you, I follow what you do and it's and still there. So if leadership was like a vehicle, if you want, like a car or a bus or whatever, then, you know, uh, what fuels that courage is actually collaboration. So every team that is superior in results have this characteristic, they're able to uphold a culture of collaboration, which everybody talks to everybody, and everybody collaborates with everybody. So this is really what will get you and keep you going. So that is the thing to treasure. So that's my advice to you, to respond to the second question. Thank you. Alain, did you want to comment on that? Well, yes. In fact, um, uh, uh, I th think, Basically, uh, the, the, the UNOSAT is a, 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 a great result of what can two UN agencies um, um, thinking in the right way can achieve. Uh, when uh, Francesco says that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, I, I was part, I came from, uh, from UNOPS, that was probably, um, I, at least uh, in terms of budget, about uh, 100 or 200 times bigger than you know, UNITA. But UNITER was having a mandate that was uh, neglected at that time. The research and training, training and research. And this was really the, 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 the perfect fit between uh, um, uh, uh, basically a, a, a a, a need that was coming from the field, represented and, and carried with the power of UNOPS, that was an outfit of uh, UNDP, which is one of the major uh, uh, agencies within the UN system. And uh, uh, this institution that was uh, looking for its way, and, and I think that uh, the, the, the UNOSAT has, has contributed to to uh, re-energize uh, re uh, uh, UNITA, isn't it true? <laughs> yeah, to, to some extent, we also have, uh, you know, our uh, current uh, executive director that I think uh, deserves uh, much the honor of re-energizing uh, that together with my, my uh, other director colleagues, of course. Um, so uh, that's for sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, unless there are any questions, I do want to take a little bit of time towards the end to recognize uh, our partners because uh, we are such a small team at UNOSAT. And um, uh, of course, uh, you know, the sustainable development um, uh, um, goal number 17 is partnerships. And uh, we, of course, uh, the, the partnerships way before the sustainable development agenda uh, was, was defined. Um, and I do you think that it's important for us to, to, to pay tribute to those partners. So if you allow me uh, just a few moments, I would like to, to thank um, our, our many of our partners. Uh, firstly, thanks to you and ASCAP for hosting our Bangkok office for be and being such a great partner. We're now collaborating on many fronts, such as practical tools for decision-making towards disaster risk reduction. The United Nations Operations and Crisis Center in New York, in the UN headquarter, is hosting UNOSAT staff and making sure that our analysis is timely provided to the top UN leadership. The UN Refugee Agency for many successes in helping some of the most vulnerable people. Seeing how many aspects of satellite imagery applications are used by this agency is truly stunning. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which we support on a regular basis with satellite imagery analysis of potential human rights violations. 
This also includes support to United Nations mandated commissions of inquiry, fact-finding missions and investigations. UNESCO, we are collaborating to document damaged cultural heritage sites, both in conflict situations and during disasters, such as earthquakes and tropical cyclones. The UN Global calls for a collaboration on AI and machine learning, leading to the Pulse satellite tool that we just saw being applied by UNHCR. UNDP for the great partnership covering a range of areas linked to development. There are so many places where we, we collaborate with UNDP. Uh, and you just saw one example uh, from, from Vanuatu. Uh, the UN uh, DRR for excellent collaboration on various aspects of disaster risk reduction, taking it to the national level and uh, down to local communities, hence making an impact where people live uh, in collaboration with member states. Uh, UN OCHA as well, uh, we would like to see how one of the longest standing collaborations of um, UNOSAT, uh, UN, uh, UNOCHA is the agency that is triggering our rapid mapping service the most. We also collaborate um, uh, in the joint and the global disaster alert and coordination system, GTAX, together with our colleagues at the EC Joint Research Center. We also work with WFP for a rapid mapping service, helping the organization with timely information during disasters and conflicts. Uh, finally, also UNICEF uh, for rapid mapping, as well as special focus on children during conflict situations. We work with the World Health Organization. Initially, we collaborated on polio vaccination, but this has now been expanded to many application areas, including mapping of health centers during conflicts and disaster situations. I mentioned the REACH partnerships. This is, um, uh, has been really a, a wonderful uh, collaboration, uh, together with the Impact Initiative and ACTED. Here we are serving the humanitarian community with interagency assessment, remote sensing, and joint analysis. The Commonwealth Secretariat for a great collaboration in the common sensing uh, project, ensuring countries get access to climate finance using facts-based information derived from satellite imagery and geospatial information technologies. Also, I would like to thank the satellite applications Catapult in the UK for their role in common sensing together with the several partners from the UK. Uh, also, many thanks to the governments of Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands for hosting UNOSAT's colleagues at their premises. And this is something I would like to really highlight. We have seen how important it is to be present on the ground over time. And so that is what we are doing in Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. And being there over time means that we learn a lot, we understand the needs, and we're able to provide the information that is needed to the various actors on the ground. Uh, also, the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, BADEA, where we are developing a monitoring tool for cost-effective assessment of infrastructure projects. As you um, heard from the message from the Secretary General, our partnership with International Charter on Space and Major Disasters ensures timely satellite analysis during disaster situations. This is a partnership that we have had since 2003. In this context, I would also like to thank our colleagues at the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs for the good collaboration. In addition, I would like to thank the US Department of State for their highly valuable support when it comes to accessing high-resolution high satellite imagery. Their in-kind support ensures our services are timely provided in a cost-effective manner. Finally, CERN. Without CERN, there would be no UNOSAT. It's as simple as that. Alain also explained that to me. Our, all our IT infrastructure is hosted at CERN, but also the scientific collaboration is fundamental. CERN has been absolutely instrumental in helping us develop our AI tools. I would also like to thank our financial contributors from Norway, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Sweden, Qatar, and the European Union. I'm also grateful for the government of Switzerland for their support. Now, what is next? We have now turned 20 years. Uh, what will the future look like? I think UNOSAT will continue to advance the applications of satellite technologies for the benefit of member states and sister agencies. We will do so by combining decision-making tools with capacity development, always through an in-depth understanding of needs. And this is really important. There's no one size fits all. We will strive to ensure practical impacts from satellite imagery technologies. The COVID situation has opened the eyes of many when it comes to an understanding that satellite analysis can actually be obtained of areas hard to physically get to, thus also contributing to leaving no one behind. The UN system and member states can rely on UNOSAT being ready to help when needed. Finally, I would really like to thank the fantastic UNOSAT team. You guys deserve all the credit, really.
Thank you for producing the high quality products. Thank you to our admin personnel who ensures operations are running smoothly. Thank you to the whole team that ensured that we deliver like never before during the COVID situation. I'm so proud of you all. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful uh, event. And I would like to, to see, uh, maybe Alan, you, would you have something to say? Yes, just um, forward looking. Um, you know, SAT has now uh, thousands of friends within and outside uh, the United Nations system. Um, now I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm working from the private sector and I'm working very hard preparing a, a constellation of 80 nano satellites that will embark hyperspectral. And in my view, this is likely to become the new frontier. It's very tough. There are a lot of technological challenges, but uh, it's what I'm working hard to be able to contribute to, uh, to UNOSAT, that, uh, that is basically the, the key hub between the uh, private sector and the UN system and the people that are working uh, in the field and the people that are benefiting from this huge work. Thank you, Alain. And, Thank this you. Is called, and this is called Promete. You will hear about it. <laughs> Thank you, Alain. Very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, are there any other questions for the team? No, if not, then um, we're going to celebrate here in the office. Uh, of course, we would like to have uh, all of you here, uh, but that's not possible, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we will have a little birthday cake here, maybe some bubbles, and we will celebrate. And, and um, really, thanks to the whole team for, for their huge efforts. Uh, I'm really proud of this team uh, and just a set of wonderful people. And uh, I think we have a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to see how we can advance uh, this, uh, the applications of satellite technology together. Thank you so much.